praise God for that. Um, this morning, I'm going to have you open up your Bibles to Philippians chapter 3, verses 4 through 11. I'm going to read it, and then we're going to jump right in. But I guess I need to get my glasses first. Hold on. All right, now we're in. Philippians chapter 3. <clears throat> I'm going to back up to verse 1 just so we follow through with where we're at. Further, my brothers and sisters, rejoice in the Lord. It is no trouble for me to write the same things to you again, and it is a safeguard for you. Watch out for those dogs, those evildoers, those mutilators of the flesh. For it is we who are the circumcision, we who serve God by His Spirit, who boast in Christ Jesus, and who put no confidence in the flesh. Though I myself have reasons for such confidence, if someone else thinks they have reasons to put confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, in regard to the law of Pharisee, as for zeal, persecuting the church, as for righteousness based on the law, faultless. But whatever were gains to me, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them garbage that I may gain Christ and, I be, and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God on the basis of faith. I want to know Christ, yes, to know the power of his resurrection and, particip and participation in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death and so somehow attaining to the resurrection from the dead. Amen. Thank you, Paul, for writing that. So this morning, I want to talk about salvation gains. Gains. <clears throat> In the fitness world, it's all about them gains. Everybody wants to make gains. In the fitness world, depending on what your goal is, whether you want to be the strongest person or the most fit person or whatever, they get into the gym and they're all about the gains. They're going to work out. They're going to do all these things. They take supplements for the gains. They eat dozens of eggs every day for the gains. They do all kinds of other proteins and powders and all that. And, and, and you may ask, why do you do that? For the gains. They also deny themselves things for the gains. Many of them, if they're, if they're strict, they'll drink no alcohol because I don't want it to mess with my gains. They don't drink any junk food because I don't want it to mess with my gains. I want to make sure I go to bed at 9 o'clock all the time so I get my 8 hours of sleep so I don't mess with the what? The gains. Don't mess with my gains. And here we see Paul is talking about all that you can gain in Christ Jesus. And very similar. Very similar. There are things that he looks forward to, things that he will do for the gains, things that he will resist and abstain from for the gains. In the fitness world, they exchange moments of happiness for the physical gains. It's like, no, 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 I can't go out tonight because i got to work out. It's leg day tomorrow. I don't want to mess with my gains. So they make an exchange for the gains, okay? There's always an exchange. You give, you give something. You, you, you give out and the gains come back. One of the greatest exchanges in the Bible we've seen, their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me will find it. What good will it be for someone to gain the whole world and yet forfeit their soul? Or what can anyone give in exchange for their soul? He's telling us, what are you willing to exchange for your soul? What could you possibly give to gain the world, to gain eternal life, to gain salvation? And Paul tells us right here in Philippians 4, in Philippians 3, sorry, 4, 4 through 11, that exchanging your life for Christ will give you the gains beyond your wildest imagination. We said last week that Jesus is worth Jesus is everything. And Paul continues on and says, Jesus is worth everything. Jesus is everything. When it comes to salvation, when it comes to us experiencing eternal life and in the, in the infilling of the Spirit of God, Jesus is everything. You do not have to add anything to Jesus. His, he completely 
accomplished all that was necessary for us to have a relationship and be right with God through the power of the cross and the death and his burial and his resurrection. There's nothing else we need to do. And that's what he addressed and what we talked about last week. Not, you don't need to add circumcision. You don't need to add laws and different things and dietary restrictions and, and reading the right Bible translation or going to church on the correct day. Whatever. All those things are, are ridiculous. That Jesus is everything. And he continues on and says, listen, not only is he everything, he is worth everything that you have to gain Jesus Christ. Paul uses his own personal resume to express how worthless any of our human accomplishments really are in making us righteous. In verse 5 and 6, basically he tells us Paul was a religious elite. If there was anyone who was going to gain salvation, it was going to be Paul. Through sheer determination. Through sheer determination and through being born to the right people. But he's put no confidence in his flesh. He put no confidence in his ability. He put no confidence in his religion, his, his sincerity, his race, tribe, rank, or self-righteousness. He looked at all that because he was born into the right tribe, in the right tribe of Israel. He was circumcised by the law on the, the, on the right day. He was a zealot. He persecuted the church. He killed Christians in the name of God because he thought they were, they were heretics and he wasn't going to let them taint what they knew of the law of Moses. He was all out. And he says he kept the law blamelessly, faultlessly. If there's anyone who's going to be able to make it to heaven on keeping the law of God, it was going to be Paul. And he tells us it was worth nothing. It was garbage. Depending on the translation of Bible that you read, it's either garbage, garbage, rubbish, trash, or dung. That's basically, it's excrement. It's something that you throw away and get rid of. And that was all of his accomplishments were worth nothing. In Matthew chapter 13, Jesus gives us a parable. The parable of the hidden treasure and the pearl. And he says, The kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field. When a man found it, he hid it again. And then in his joy went and sold all he had and bought that field. Now think about that, okay? He found a treasure in a field. He, carried, he buried it up. He's like, oh man, I can't let anybody else know. And he went and he sold everything he had because he wanted that field. I need that field. People were like, okay, fine, buy the field. Well, they didn't realize that there was a treasure in that field that it was worth everything to him. He sold out completely so that he could gain the treasure that he found. Paul, Jesus goes on and says, again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant looking for the fine pearls. And when he found one of great value, he went away, he sold everything he had, and he bought it. Sold everything he had, and he bought the pearl, the, the thing of great price. He said, okay, if I can scrounge up enough. And that's exactly what Paul did. That's so exactly what Paul was saying. He's like, everything that I thought was gain is lost. I, I put it all in to know Christ. Because Christ is worth everything. Christ is the treasure hidden in the field. Jesus Christ is that pearl of great worth that's worth everything. There's nothing in this world that isn't worth letting go and getting rid of in order to gain Jesus Christ. He is worth it all. And you see, Paul, when he was at the pinnacle of his religious life, he was a religious elite. He was persecuting the church. He was going around grabbing Christians and throwing them in prison and having them killed. And then he had an encounter with Jesus Christ. On the road to Damascus, he was knocked off his horse. And Jesus spoke to him. He said, Paul, or Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? And who is this? He was blinded. He said, this is Jesus whom you persecute. He had an encounter with Jesus Christ. His encounter with Jesus Christ, though it blinded him, it opened his eyes to the realization that Jesus is everything. That Jesus is worth everything. That Jesus is that treasure. Jesus is that pearl of great price. And Paul wanted the gains. He wanted the gains. 
so desperately that he exchanged everything he had, everything that he'd worked for, he exchanged it for knowing Jesus Christ. And so this morning, we're going to take a look. I, I, on the back of your little bulletin handout, I have about five things in regards to the salvation and the gains that we get in salvation. And for some, it may be a reminder. For others of us, hopefully it'll be an encouragement. But you know what? This may be difficult. And you feel like maybe you've, you've given everything, you've lost everything. But it's worth it. It's worth it for the gains. Salvation comes with great gains. But you have to make the exchange. There, are, there is some exchange that you have to do. And so let's look at this. The first thing Paul had to exchange was his religion for a relationship with Jesus Christ. He had to exchange. He had to get rid of all, the, all that he thought was important in his religious pursuit of righteousness with God. He had to give it all away for his relationship with Christ. He says, what is more, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. Everything else, useless waste other than knowing Christ. And Jesus tells us in John 17, 3, what eternal life is. He says, this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. I want you to understand this. Eternal life is knowing God. Eternal life is knowing Jesus Christ. It's knowing them. I think too, too often we stop at just being made right with God. And, and, and that's good. It's a step that we need to take. But so much emphasis in the gospel is like, oh, we need to be made right with God. Your sins need to be forgiven. Christ died for you. He made you right. He's justified you. And now you can stand right before God as if you have never sinned. You're made right with God. And that's important. And that's the first step. But that's not the end goal. The end goal of eternal life, the end goal of salvation is to know Jesus Christ is to know the only true God. It's to know the one who makes us right with God. It's, called, it's a personal relationship. That, the word know in the Greek is gnosis or gnosko. It literally means a, an experiential knowledge where you've spent time with this person, not just knowing about them. Too many people stop at just knowing about Jesus. Well, I read the book once. Someone told me about him. I can tell you, yeah, he, he died on a cross, he was buried, and they, they, tell, they say he was raised to life again. You can know things about Christ, you can know things about the Word, you can know things about people, just by reading or, or listening. But that's not what Paul is talking about. He's talking about knowing, knowing Jesus Christ. Knowing Him, someone or something through personal involvement. How do you get to know someone? Oftentimes, you have to spend time with that someone. You pray, you talk, you share, you worship, you get around others who know them. And the best way to get to know any person is just to begin a conversation, to have a conversation with them, to listen to them, to listen to their hearts, their, their desires, their dreams, their goals, their, all of these things. It's personal involvement. It's being involved in their life. And that's what Paul is talking about. He's talking about a knowledge of Jesus Christ beyond just the head knowledge. It's knowing Him. I know my Savior. I know my Lord. The Hebrew equivalent in the Old Testament is the word yada. Ta-da! No, yada. <clears throat> yada. It's used oftentimes when Adam knew Eve. And on and on and on. It's about a union of love. It's the closest intimate relationship you, a husband and wife can have. It's that love. It's knowing someone intimately because you spent time with them, because you, you, you've spent your, your energies listening and learning, and you're in this union of love. And so the equivalent to the Gnosis is, is Gara. And so Paul is telling us that eternal life, that the gains that you get, you can do all your religion you want and never know Jesus. You can do all the religious things that you want and never know Him, never have an intimate relationship with God that you say, I know Jesus and He knows me. Just like the Song of Solomon, where the Beloved says, I, my, the Beloved is mine and I am His. There, there, is a, there is a union there that is made. And that's what Paul wants to know. He, everything else is trash compared to the surpassing 
wealth and wonderful, awesome relationship he could have with Jesus Christ. You see, Paul doesn't want us to just be right with God. He wants us to know Jesus Christ personally and intimately. And you see a picture of this. What does this type of relationship look like? It, he shares a little bit of a glimpse of it in Galatians 2.20, where he says, I have been crucified with Christ, and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Just think about this verse for a moment. This is the relationship that Paul is talking about. It literally is a relationship with Jesus Christ where he doesn't know where he ends and Christ begins. They're intertwined. So often Paul uses, we are in Christ. Right? We, like, we put on the skin suit. of Jesus. We are intertwined. You can't tell where I end and Jesus begins. That's the relationship that he so desires that is worth throwing away everything else that the world could possibly offer, anything else that you could possibly work towards. It is garbage, except for knowing Jesus Christ, to be so intertwined in a relationship with him that you can't tell the difference where you end and where Christ begins. Paul exchanged his religion for that type of relationship. And it's there and, and available for us as well. You can go beyond just the head knowledge of knowing what Jesus Christ has done for you. And you can go on and have a relationship with Jesus Christ. A personal relationship where you can wake up in the morning and be like, Hey, Jesus, what do we got going on today? And you can spend time in prayer and knowing, God, what is, what is it that you want me to know? What is your heart for, for me today? What, is, what are these things? But it takes time. It takes discipline. It takes effort. It takes getting in his word. It takes time in prayer. It takes getting around other people who are on the same journey saying, yeah, I want to know Jesus like that too. And we walk together and we get to know how Jesus works and interacts and his compassion and his grace and his mercy. The other thing that we learn, we gain, is not only the knowledge of Christ and a personal relationship with him, but we gain righteousness. You see, Paul exchanged his rags for Christ's robes. He exchanged all that he worked for that is just garbage for the robes of righteousness, being made right with God. He says, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law. Right? He, he, he goes, I, I was self-righteous. I kept all the rules. I did all the good things. I did everything that I was supposed to do. I was self-righteous. I, I thought I did enough good stuff. He didn't want that righteousness. He exchanged that righteousness, his works righteousness, for Christ's righteousness. Right? We, we said this last week. There is the religion of human achievement, and there's a religion of divine accomplishment. He's like, I'm laying the human achievement aside. It is not what I want. It is just self-righteousness. It doesn't make me right with God. Only faith in Jesus Christ and his accomplishment on the cross makes me right with him. So Paul acknowledged that the best he could do, and he was faultless at keeping the law, the best he could do was still garbage. It was trash. To drive this point home, I may need to get a little crude, but it's not me, it's the Bible. In Isaiah 64, 6, the prophet says, All of us have become like one who is unclean, and all our righteous acts are like filthy rags. All right? just so you can have an understanding in your brain. All of your righteous acts outside of faith in Jesus Christ are filthy rags. Those filthy rags in the Old Testament are talking about a woman's menstrual rags. What do they do with them? They throw them away. They're unclean and they throw them away. That's what our righteous work is. That's what our deeds are working our way to, to impress God in some way that hopefully God will love me more. Hopefully God will accept me. It's all filthy rags. And Jesus has, Paul has said, I've acknowledged that. All, of my, all the things, the way that I was born and how I did my religion and how zealous I was at persecuting the church and how faultless I was at keeping the law of Moses is all trash. All I want is the righteousness that comes by faith in Jesus Christ. Without Christ, all we have to offer God as it says in Romans, fall short. 
Everything we offer him falls short, except for Jesus. And by faith, we exchange our garbage for Christ's robes of righteousness. And I love 2 Corinthians 5.21. It's a great verse to, to have in your, in your mind, to memorize at some point in time. It says, God made him, speaking of Jesus Christ, God made him who had no sin. Right? Jesus was sinless, spotless, perfect lamb of God. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us. He became sin for you and me. He took our sin upon himself. The big exchange. Here's the great exchange for the gains of salvation. We gave him our filthy rags. We gave him our garbage, our dung, our trash, our rubbish. He took it. He became it. So that in him we might become the righteousness of God. What an amazing exchange that is. He takes our trash and he robes us and he clothes us in these robes of righteousness. His righteousness. His perfect, sinless, spotless robes of righteousness. Wow. What an amazing exchange that is. And Paul says it is worth it all. Let everything else go. Give it all away to know that you are made right with God and it is through faith in Jesus Christ. It's his faith. And I, and I love this. John MacArthur gave a great definition of this type of faith. What is this faith that, that, that exchanges our garbage for, for Christ's robes of righteousness? And he says, this faith is the confident, continuous confession of total dependence and trust in Jesus for the necessary requirements to enter God's kingdom. That's the type of faith we're talking about. The faith saying, I completely believe, I completely trust in Jesus Christ on a daily, day by day, moment by moment, time in my life. Every situation I trust that Jesus, he has accomplished this. Jesus has made me righteous. I can do nothing. I can give nothing. Anything that I do give is garbage. But I can confidently and continuously confess that I completely depend on Jesus Christ. And that I know that Jesus fulfilled all the requirements of the law. Jesus fulfilled it all upon the cross at Calvary. And I am forgiven. And I have the right to enter into the kingdom of heaven. It's that type of faith. It's that type of faith. Paul also exchanged his weakness for Christ's power. Not only what a great gain of salvation. The gains that we can get in salvation is the gains of knowing Jesus Christ. Knowing your personal Savior. The Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Knowing the one who formed you. Knowing the one who created you. Who, who put a destiny and, and purpose in your life. Knowing Him is a great gain and worth the exchange. Having that relationship is worth giving it all away. Having the, the, the knowledge and understanding that my sins are completely forgiven because they have been laid upon Christ Jesus. They have been put upon Him. I can stand before God and say, it's nothing I did other than I put my faith in Christ who took my sin, who became sin for me, that I might become the righteousness of God. I have nothing. Jesus is, is everything. And he did it all for us. And it's worth the exchange. Give him your past. Give him your failures. Give him your sin. So many people stand and, and, and away from the cross and they stand over there. like, oh, I can't. I, I, I like what you're saying. I, I love listening to the gospel. But I've done too many awful things. You don't know what I've done. You don't understand my past. You don't know how, how depraved I really am. You don't understand where my mind goes. Doesn't matter. Jesus does. And Jesus has taken it all upon himself. He knows how much of a filthy, rotten sinner you and I are. And he took our sin and he became sin for us. Your past is forgiven because it has been crucified with Christ. It was dead and buried. It has been dead and buried when Christ paid the penalty for our sin. All of your sin, 
Past, present, and future. And for us, all of our sin was future when He died. He died for all of our sins. He knew that we were going to commit. He still died for them. He knew how depraved and how wretched we were, and He still died for them. And He said, I want them. Give them to me. All your filthy rags, all your excrement, all your dung, all the garbage, give it to me. I take it upon myself. And hey, here you go. Let me put a beautiful, spotless, perfect robe of righteousness around you. How wonderful is that? It's worth the exchange. Don't get bogged down and, and don't hang on to your garbage. Let it go. Give it to Jesus. He's already taken it. Give it to Him. And here, Paul exchanged is also his weakness for Christ's power. What an amazing gain of salvation. Not only do we get the knowledge of Jesus Christ, a relationship with our Creator, not only do we get the robes of righteousness that our sins are washed away and forgiven and cleansed and we can live a new life in Christ Jesus, but we also get the power, the power of Christ's resurrection. That is a gain of salvation if I've ever known one. He says, I want to know Christ. Yes, to know the power of His resurrection. You see, there is no power. Paul understood there was no power in the law. The law that Paul kept faultlessly also kept him from victory. He goes into a very long discourse in, in Romans talking about the law and, and the purpose of the law. The law is perfect. He wasn't, he wasn't bashing the law. He was saying the law was perfect. It did exactly what it was supposed to do. It told me right and wrong. It told me what God approved of and what God disapproved of. He told me what sin, the law told me what sin was. And he goes on to say, if, if, if the law didn't tell me what, that coveting was a sin, I would have known. But now that it told me that, that coveting is a sin, all I can do is covet. <laughs> like, yeah, I hear you, Paul. I hear you. Like, I was good until I understood what sin was. And it did it perfectly. But the thing that sin couldn't do is it couldn't free us from sin. It could, it, it, the law could only tell us what it was. But it didn't ever give us the power to, have, to conquer it. And here in salvation, and when you put your faith in Jesus Christ, not only are you forgiven of your sins, not only has Christ washed your sins away, but He has given you the power to fight, the power to resist temptation, the power to have victory over your sin. And I love this in Romans 8, 11, it says, And if the Spirit of Him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, He who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies because of His Spirit who lives in you. I want you to understand. I mean, I don't know if we can understand. The power that was unleashed upon the tomb that Jesus was laying in to raise a crucified Savior from death to life. That power was probably the power of multiple atomic bombs going off that raised Christ from the dead. That power has now do, 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 come inside you. I don't know why. I just autom it's in. That same power, because the same Spirit that raised Christ from the dead now lives in us. That's power. That's power. That's wonder-working power. Okay? That's amazing power. And Paul says, listen, it is worth all the exchange. I will give up everything to have that power, to know that power, to experience that power where, this, where the law kept me kept me confined and kept me in prison because I knew my sin. I knew that I, couldn't, I could not in my own flesh defeat the sin in my life. Jesus not only died for our sin, but He gave us the power to conquer our sin. And Paul says, it's worth the exchange. It's worth the exchange. Romans 8, 3-4 says, For what the law was powerless to do because it was weakened by the flesh, God did by sending His own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh, to be a sin offering. And so he condemned sin in the flesh in order that the righteous requirements of the law might be fully met in us who do not live according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. Again, the law was perfect in informing us of right and wrong, but it was powerless to do anything about it. And then Jesus came and he fulfilled the law. And he destroyed sin. And he conquered sin. And he says, hey, 
I'm going to give you the spirit, the same spirit that I relied on and lived with and lived in me, the spirit of God, and I'm going to give that to every believer, every person who puts their faith in me as their savior, as the one who's conquered sin and death and hell, and I will implant you, I will inside you put the power of God, the same power that raised me from the dead, now lives in you so that you can walk out this life. This is going to be hard. It's going to be difficult. And there's still sin that is in this world that we need to deal with in our, own, in our own flesh. But I'm giving you the weapon. I'm giving you the power to do it. If you trust in Jesus Christ and allow the Spirit of God to work in you. Ephesians 3.20 says, Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine according to his power that is at, is at work within us. Right? Again, Paul continues to tell us, that the Holy Spirit, the power is at work in us. You want to know that power. And in order to know that power, you need to put your faith in Jesus Christ. Jesus tells us again in Acts 1.8. He says to the disciples, he says, hey, you need to stay in Jerusalem. He says, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you will be, in my, you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. You know, if Jesus says the Holy Spirit is the power. The Holy Spirit is the power to conquer your sin, to conquer the sin in your life, the, the, the temptations, the traps, the, all those things that have held you bound for so many years, held you bound in, in, in chains. The Holy Spirit is the power to release you. The Holy Spirit has the power to conquer. You just need to put your faith in Jesus Christ. It's worth the exchange, right? Paul says in, in Corinthians, he says, when I am weak, he is strong. He prayed over and over, God, take this weakness from me. Take this thorn from me. And God says, my grace is sufficient. Because Why? Because when you're weak, I am strong. The power of the Holy Spirit begins to rise up. There. So stop trying to fight on your own. Stop trying to fight on your own flesh. It's not going to work. And if it does work, you just, you just become self-righteous and self-determined. And it's just garbage anyway. So allow Jesus Christ, surrender it to the Lord. Say, God, I can't do it. I can't fight. I, can't, I continue to lose. I give it to you. I am weak in this area. And that's where I said, good. Let the Holy Spirit who I put in you, that same spirit that raised Christ from the dead, let it reside in you and work in you and give you victory. I'm going to tackle the other two next week as we conclude this part. But I want you to understand that when I am weak, when you are weak, we still make gains. We still make gains. Because He is strong. There are great gains in salvation. And perhaps we don't always think about it. We don't always spend enough time to think, well, what did I gain in salvation? Whether we know, like, okay, I, I got eternal life. I'm going to spend eternity in heaven. I'm going to spend eternity in, in the presence of God and the King. I don't go to hell. That's great. My sins are forgiven. That's awesome. But Paul here is telling us, man, it is so much more than that. It is a relationship. You get to have a relationship, an intimate knowledge and understanding of Jesus Christ. Wow. You get clothed in His robes of righteousness. Your sins are forgiven. You get to walk around as though you are perfectly made right in God through Jesus Christ. And you have a power that resides in you. The same power, the Spirit of God lives now lives in you and can allow you to conquer the things that have held you down and chained you for so many years. Like it's worth it. It's so much more worth it. I'm going to ask the worship team to come up. And as they do, I just want to, want to close in prayer. Heavenly Father, we want to thank you for your word today. God, I thank you that as we think about salvation, as we think about our faith in Jesus Christ, that not only will we go beyond just being justified, going on beyond, beyond just being made right with God, but Lord, that we get to know you. That's eternal life, knowing you, Jesus. So God, I pray that if anyone here today has not experienced that great exchange, our filth, our sin, our past, giving it all to you and you clothing us in your righteousness, giving us your power, giving us a relationship with you, Lord. And I pray that they would surrender themselves. Lord, that they would say, Jesus, I want to make that exchange. Jesus, I have nothing to offer you but this, my sin. And give it to him. And allow him to take it upon the cross where he, he, he bled and died. Let him clothe you in that, those robes of righteousness, being made right with God. 
that your past is gone, that you have a new life in Christ Jesus.